I'm Paul Cheshire. Uh, I'm Professor of Economic Geography in the Economics Department and I also work in the Spatial Economics Research Centre, CERC. We're building less than probably uh, less well under half of the rate of building that we should be building to meet demand and we've got an accumulated deficit of perhaps two million houses over the last 20 years that's why houses are expensive one of the sound bites that really catches people's attention is when you tell them that we've created a world in which there's actually more land covered by golf courses in surrey than there is covered by houses because 73 percent of Surrey you can't build on at all because it's in the green belt. So I've done several bits of research through the Spatial Economics Research Centre here at LSE which was funded back in 2008 by uh, BIS and uh, the Department for Communities and Local Government uh, and we're still going strong so we had within that a, a set of research programs relating to the use of land, relating to the economic effects of land use planning and relating to the housing crisis. Uh, and we've published uh, quite extensively out of that. Uh, and it's had a lot of interest, both in the, uh, you know, particularly in government and in the political world, but also in the media, I have to say. It's, it's, it, it, there's been a lot of media interest, mainly because people have really beginning to latch on to the fact that we have a real housing crisis in England and it's self-inflicted. It's not something which we're sort of running out of land or, or whatever it may be. England is actually, not much of it is built up. Only less than 10% of England is actually urbanised. People are sometimes not aware of that. And it's because we have this complete limitation on land supply. So it had an impact. First of all, I think it fed into the Barker Review. In 2003, the then government set up a strategic review of land use planning system and its impact on the housing market called the Barker Review. And I was associated with that and quite a lot of our research began to feed into that, that review. And then in the, they had a second review which published in 2006 where they actually commissioned research, some research from us on the impacts of planning on the costs of offices, very, very substantial. It uh, turned out that in, in the highest, uh, most restrictive parts of London, there was something like an 800% equivalent tax on the costs of constructing more office space. Um, so that, that had a, quite a significant impact, I think, on official thinking. It's led to the setting up of uh, the, the reforms post Barker, or it was influential in leading to those post Barker re reforms. That was swept away, of course, in 2010 when we had a new government with new, way, new ways of thinking about it. Uh, and they then to set out to, first of all, agree to this community infrastructure levy. The idea is to have an impact fee on the uplift in land values, which is created by giving planning permission, but the uplift, a tax which relates to the costs that that development imposes on the community. Because, of course, if you build more houses, this does have a cost on local people. Uh, it you know, becomes more crowded, more congested. Infrastructure gets uh, overused. There's noise and disruption. People lose their views. So you do need to have compensation as a re in order to offset for those costs. And the community infrastructure levy was an attempt to do that more transparently than the existing system uh, did. Um, secondly, the government set out to try and entirely reform and recast and simplify the basic planning policies in this new uh, national uh, planning policy framework document, which did take on the basic message that we had been trying to communicate, which is that development is not necessarily bad for the environment. You can what you need to do is protect environmentally valuable land and high amenity land and open spaces whereas it doesn't take very much land to build on. So if you've got development which is sustainable then there should be a presumption that it's okay. The problem is of course if it's going to be destroying important habitats or environmental land or, or, or taking up land which is, very, which is valuable for recreation or amenity. And one of the uh, elements in that was to recognise that you had to take account of the impact on prices because being so restrictive on land supply, which our policy has been over the last uh, 50, more than 50 years since 1955, uh, means that 
if you can get permission to convert an acre or a hectare of agricultural land on the edge of London from agricultural land uh, into housing, then the value of it goes up from sort of 10 to 20,000 pounds a hectare to perhaps 10 million pounds a hectare. So there's a huge price distortion in the land market, which is reflected in what we have to pay for housing. So the argument is that the uh, policy needs to take account of local shortages of land for housing, which is reflected in the price of land. Uh, economists are quite good at sort of talking about f analyzing fundamentals. They're not very good at analyzing turning points. So th there's obviously a political problem. There's huge self-interest which is built into the status quo created by keeping land supply short and houses expensive. All those people who own houses out in the green belt are winners and they're going to fight like hell to retain those values. On the other hand, we are increasingly pricing people out of the market. It gets worse and worse and worse over time because incomes are rising and people's demand for housing increases as they get richer. But in addition, by keeping supply so inelastic, you get more and more price volatility. So every time there's a downturn you get a collapse in house prices and whenever there's a boom in the market you get a huge increase in house prices which creates real problems of economic management which the Treasury are increasingly aware of which the Bank of England are increasingly aware of so can I say that it's going to change yes I, I'm wholly confident that we're going to relax the planning system. It's a long-term process. I only hope that we will, and I hope our workers help to convince people that we should relax the planning system in a strategic and considered way, which preserves the qualities of the environment that we value whilst releasing more land, rather than waiting for some real financial catastrophe and collapse.